why are you bad for the economy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, it started like a joke um, uh, because I was getting uh, frequent comments from people telling me after following you on Twitter for a while, I decided to quit my grueling job and you know work less and enjoy life more. So, uh, and I'm not joking. I was getting something like this almost every week. Right, somebody in the DMs telling me something similar. And once I tweeted basically this, like I'm getting this uh, often, I'm becoming bad for the economy. And it sort of stuck a little bit as an insider joke, like people started using it like, oh, I'm also bad for the economy. I did this and that. But I think over time, that statement evolved because I started to realize that um, uh, there's a common mis mistake, a like misconception that what is good for the collective is sometimes assumed to be also good for the individuals. And we hear politicians talk, you know, sometimes on both ends, sometimes saying, you know, we should improve the economy, we should grow the economy, blah, blah, blah. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the people under the economy are necessarily uh, enjoying the growth. In fact, we all know that the economy could be growing, the GDP could be growing, but 99% of the people in that population could be seeing their income or wealth diminishing. It's not inconsistent. It's actually very, um, uh, very, uh, very common that it happens. And I started to see this pattern and this sort of misconception almost everywhere. Uh, you know, I have a background in software and tech. And for example, uh, people look at Silicon Valley as something that's growing. They measure the number of startup exits and the wealth created by Silicon Valley or by venture capital backed companies. And they assume sort of that all the individuals or most of the individuals participating in that collective are also benefiting. Whereas the, the reality is that in the situations usually it's true that the group is growing, but like some most of the times 99% or even more 99.9% of the people in that part in that group are not seeing any payoff, like uh, sometimes seeing negative income, negative growth, negative wealth or whatever. Right? And the average, basically, that gets dragged by some freak outliers, which are usually inaccessible by people, you know, in a single lifetime. <laughs> right? So um, I, I'm, I became fond of this idea because, I don't, first of all, it's not something I discovered myself, whatever, but sort of I started to, it started to become uh, very important to me. And I've been sort of trying to share it. And I've adopted it as sort of my tagline in Twitter, <laughs> right? But it has sort of the original story is like that funny joke, but eventually it, I think it evolved to something more important and more general that I think more people should reflect on when they examine, um, you know, uh, the prospects of what they're participating in. And it's curious that this started as a joke because a guy who's bad for the economy and a bridge dweller enter into a bar and yeah. i think i don't even know how the joke continues but it's it's like yeah because in my case my tagline also now is bridge dweller mm -hmm. but it started as a joke because i want to bridge the gap between academia and industry I ended up dwelling under that bridge. Then I moved to Salamanca and there's this nice Roman bridge there. So I started taking pictures of it and uh, yeah. it stuck. So, but yeah, that's, this is on the, I want to kind of push back a bit against that because I always see your, your tweets about, uh, what you just said, right? The difference between what it, what might be good for the collective is not necessarily good for the individual. And then you might have all sort all kinds of followers, right? They might be inspired. Uh, they they see you on Twitter, they follow you, and they start seeing your tweets, and they decide, oh, I need to quit because mm -hmm. that's what I should do. Yeah. <laughs> so. Is that kind of a prudent thing to do? Just, you know, uh, I, if, if, I, if I'm following you now and I think to myself, oh, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I have this job. I'm not that happy. Well, I might as well quit. Mm -hmm. Is that what you uh, advocate? Uh, uh, no, um, I, I sincerely believe that um, 
uh, we're all slightly slightly different you know I think we're mostly you know humans are mostly similar <laughs> right? but we have subtle differences and I think uh, I, I generally believe that there are people who uh, are more comfortable in a more structured and environment on the regular daily basis work arrangements whatever and there are others on a slightly different end of the spectrum where uh, this structure wears them out, right? And they can't function properly. Um, I think it's super important for people to discover uh, what their true preference is. And uh, I, I honestly believe that it's very hard to change your nature, right? It's, you know, if if you're trying to, if you, if you have a palm tree and you're trying to grow it in Alaska, it's, you can do it, right? You can create a greenhouse, uh, create artificial lightning, control the humidity, control the temperature, control all the variables to make the palm tree survive in a completely different environment. But it's a complete, it's a continuous struggle because now you need to control everything. It's a very fragile setup right? because if the power goes out, your palm tree will suddenly become cold and die right? if there's a leak or whatever. Right. And metaphorically, I think this is what happens to us when, when we're in the wrong environment. Like if you're the kind of person who don't like uh, having to ask for permission, working on a schedule, the rigid nine to five uh, frequency, right, the monotonous slog, uh, and you, you're generally that kind of person, right, living in a corporate environment is going to wear you out. I think first mentally and very soon physically, right? Uh, mental health, physical health, and everything. And I don't think it's something you know you can just cope long term, right? Because it's harmful probably to you. And I think in that situation, probably the best way is to change your environment. Like the palm tree, the best way for the palm tree to be happy is to take it to a tropical place. And but yeah, I think it's the, it's important to discover like are you a pine tree or a palm tree, <laughs> right? Or something in between in the spectrum, uh, because yes, it's not just a binary thing. I'm sure that right? there's tolerance. In fact, I don't think I'm the most extreme. I can tolerate. In fact, I tolerated a structured work arrangement for like 12, 13 years, um, until sort of I came to my breaking point. I'm sure there are others who can't even tolerate that much. Uh, so I think that's my general message, right? To try to encourage people. And I think what's what's super interesting to me coming from tech, tech is one of these, more, you know, probably one of the most uh, prosperous, lucrative professions, uh, certainly in modern times. I don't know if throughout all of human history, it's so sad to be, to be seeing people with so much privilege, so much advantage, so many options. They're so skilled, so highly well paid. They could do so many things and then still get stuck in sort of this lifestyle that they dislike, right? And my anecdotal experience, right, working almost a decade in big tech has been uh, working with people, right, who seem always unhappy, unsatisfied. Uh, they're not in the right place. They're the palm tree in the greenhouse. Right? They're coping. It's a fairly fragile setup. Um, and uh, it's very unfortunate. Like, I mean, there, you have so many options. Why not exercise them, right? You could probably do something, change your work arrangements. And I think the big, biggest reason why people don't change is that they measure their life and their professional success through financial metrics. And it's true, it's hard, right? When you're well-paid, you have a good job, you, you have benefits and everything. It's hard to give all that up uh, to do something that's going to very likely earn you more. It feels like almost winning the lottery and not cashing out the whole winnings, right? So, and I, I'll admit, like, even to me, it was hard like it, to convince myself, especially when you have a family, because it's not just your money, but it's money for my kids, my family in, in total, right? So you're making a decision for the whole, for the whole unit. Um, so I'm not saying it's easy, right? But I, I, I you know, I, I like encouraging people to reconsider, right, at least, right? And, uh, inspiration can be helpful there to see somebody else doing something that you may want to do. As you work that just just would you have you had uh, you uh, Mahmoud you you uh you were breaking up I I I didn't get anything uh, uh, okay okay. You, 
you're still backing up. Uh, is it the audio like or it. the video? Or the audio. No, no, the audio. Uh, you're good now. You're good. It was, I think, let me say something. Hello, hello. <laughs> yes, yes, you're good. It was just the audio. I'm good now? Okay. You're Weird. good now. Sorry. <laughs> so, so no, I, I was saying, yeah, yeah I, I have a tongue-in-cheek question uh, because I saw mm -hmm. your tweet. Yeah, yeah. Would you have participated mm -hmm. in the Amazon? Um, uh, uh, but, because you worked at Amazon. Oh, oh certainly not. No, I, I like. Look, I'm not against w walkouts or strikes or whatever. But I, but there's a point where it becomes pathetic. It feels to me like you're seeing Wall Street bankers with their suit and tie protesting because and doing a walkout because you know they don't like the coffee in their office, something like that. It's so. I mean, these, you, you drive into the Amazon parking lot and it's full of Porsches and Teslas. And these are people with $2 million homes in the mountains. And they're out there with the poster. I don't want to come. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's uh, ridiculous, right? So I Im like imagine you're an Amazon warehouse worker, <laughs> right? I mean, peeing in bottles and sort of working for minimum wage and under harsh conditions. And then you see your manager from the headquarters office protesting outside in the streets of Seattle just because they were told to go to the office. Look, I, I don't agree with Amazon enforcing managers to go to the office. Like, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with them, with the sentiment. Like, um, uh, I, I think it's ridiculous, you know, and they should probably be working from home. But the way it's done is just so, so it's a lack of dignity, I think. That's probably probably t uh, like self-respect, right? And you again, like you're so privileged, you're so well paid, you shouldn't be doing this, right? Um, <laughs> um, uh, that's the best way I can think of describing it. Yeah, and uh, they're in a position whereby if they wanted to quit, they can just simply quit. Exactly, they could else. quit. They have so many options. There's like recruiters begging them every day. Like it's a joke. Uh, it's a joke almost. It's an insider joke in, the, in in big tech. Like so, like the recruiter recruiters nagging you because they want to give you jobs everywhere, and you're saying no all the time. Right. So so you know it's you're in that position. That we're almost, uh, it's like, <laughs> again, like it's, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very bizarre, right? So, uh, <laughs> but see, this is, this is a thing. I also uh, know people who are working for big tech, but they still are hesitant to quit. People yeah. who are also in the in the in in, in your community, right? Be it, uh, people yeah, yeah. who have uh, in common who have signed up for my philosophy courses. And uh, they they just so it's I don't know does it does it take yeah you did mention you know the the palm tree metaphor but uh, as as someone who comes from a business and philosophy background like I can understand why I would have uh, I I would think twice before I would quit my job right but when it comes to yeah. software developers and and uh, those who code etc and engineers who have these uh, uh, skills that are in high demand, right? So you're, mm -hmm. you're like, even if it, uh, even if things don't go as you plan, uh, mm -hmm. eventually you can, you have like some, you can eventually find another job, right? So you're not yeah. going to end it's, up- a, You have a, a safety net. Dweller. You have a safety net, Thanks. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then for some reason, they, they might feel hesitant because what if mm -hmm. something goes wrong or, um what if uh, i don't know i i don't end up is it yeah so w w do you think this is this is kind of um yeah they feel like they're not prepared for or they don't want this mm -hmm. nine to five so is it just a and maybe a a non-rational fear like some sort of sentiment they have but then once they take the plunge it might uh, they might realize that everything is going to be okay or is there something else that one should have for them yeah. to actually make the leap of faith. No, no. Look, I think the hesitation is is probably good, good, good information, right? There's probably a, a good reason why your subconscious is making you hesitant, and um, like if the I think if the prospect of uncertainty and no structure and not having anyone tell you exactly what you should be doing like freaks you out like scares you like if that's the the things of nightmares for you 
then probably um, you shouldn't, right? You should try to find some other arrangement, maybe something in between. If, like if you don't like full time, maybe try to, you know, freelance, for example, or part time or or continue full time in a different uh, company or switch from an office to remote or something like that. I think it's all about discovering our two preferences and trying to arrange our work arrangements in a way that matches our preferences. Right? So it's basically, it's that problem. Um, but yeah, um, uh, the, the, I think the, the, the anxiety and the, the hesitation, we should listen to them right? because they're probably telling, they're telling us something. And you know, not being prepared, I think it's, it's a different thing right? because not being prepared, I certainly wasn't prepared right, to, to work for myself. I just knew that I had to quit because it would have probably led to a mental breakdown. <laughs> right? So I sort of, it was almost like, would they say again, like maybe desperation, but almost right that uh, I had to do this, and I said somewhere or another I figured it out. But I certainly wasn't prepared. But I think again, like the negative visualization of me having to go back was the motivation I needed to to figure out a way to make it work, right? And I think that's important as well. Like, what's what is truly important for you? Is it making a lot of money? Is it uh, having some prestigious job title? Is it um, uh, just you know, having uh, a very very predictable paycheck coming in every month. Like, what are the most important things to you, right? And I think you know, try to try to derive motivation from those things, right? And make them happy. Like, I was completely okay with giving up like the stability of my income um, and the benefits and all the other job title nonsense and prestige or whatever. Um, I'm not saying that those things are not completely valueless to me, but sort of it was part of a good trade off to give up those things and get the flexibility. Um, but then I think I figured out again because of necessity, right? I, I what was killing me the most was having to go back <laughs> to where I left off, even though again I had the safety net. Again, I was never really risking going bankrupt, becoming homeless, or some other harsh situation like that. But I almost mentally wrote off that option completely because I didn't want. I, I, there's, there's, um, there's, there, there's a saying I heard from a friend um, uh, who does weightlifting, right? And who was telling me that if you're trying to lift these, you know, squats with one rep max, like these very heavy things, you know, this squat structure will have like hinges to protect you that if you can't lift it, you can put it on the hinges and it won't squash you. And my friend was telling me it's important to forget that the hinge exists, right? Because otherwise you won't activate your full strength. And I think there's something similar here. I think it's important that if you take the plunge and you don't want to go back, you almost need to forget that the safety net exists, right? To act, to, to activate your full motivation. <laughs> and um, otherwise it's very easy to just go back and let yourself fall into the safety net. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in, in this case, because we you mentioned uh, in, in your course, uh, the small bets one, that sometimes having a cushion uh, kind of hindered you or, or yeah. it, it made me more idealistic. It made me, yeah, it, it, it made me yeah. coming up because, with better alternatives. Because I think what of, happened, yeah, like, at one point in the beginning, so I was lucky I managed to save a good amount of savings that would have allowed me to continue to live off my savings for like four or five years without making any lifestyle changes, which seems like a good, great thing to have. Certainly, that's what I thought in the beginning, to have this cushion. But I think what happened to me is that when I took the plunge, I became so idealistic that I was thinking, you know, I'm not going to be dealing with small things here. I'm going to, I have so, this time, I took this big, I made this big change in my life. I'm going to go for my I build my ideal business, my ideal product. I want to build a company, something sustainable, blah blah blah, all that nonsense. Which I think that's the a very long attitude to take when you're trying to tame the uncertainty of self-employment. I think nowadays, I think if I probably if I had a shorter runway, I would have forced myself to go after small wins quickly because then it became important. It becomes obviously important that. The first goal is to pay the bills. The first goal is to survive. And I think this is the key revelation to me, right? If you want to take the plunge uh, and you want to jump into self-employment, from day one, you should be asking yourself, 
how am I going to pay the bills this month? Like focus, so today we're recording this June 1st, start of a new month. Your first goal should be, I want to uh, make as much money in June, uh, make more money than I, than I spend in June. You t and do you do it whichever way you can, of course, you know, within your ethical and principle <laughs> constraints uh, and laws. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then do the same thing in July and August and whatever. And it becomes easier over time for various reasons because you start figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Well, what you're good at, what you don't, what you're not good at. You start building uh, reputation, right? You start uh, benefiting from success, bringing it with us with it more success. Usually, I see you laughing, like you you disagree. I'm I'm three <laughs> I'm three years into this, and I was kind of forced into it. And you you know the yeah. story. Uh, well, maybe I don't know if I if mm -hmm. I know what I want to do. And within the coming six months, right? But uh, but you I know, see but where it, you're. But, but you were just telling me before we started from. recording, right? I mean that uh, you're taking a break from philosophy or you're trying to do something different. I think this is part of you learning more about yourself in the current situation. That right? you're you're improving your fitness with the environment, and the environment is everything: the market, yourself, your circumstances. Like you know, if if. Like, if, for example, you know, having a kid changes your life significantly. Now your circumstances changes. You have limited time. You have dependents who depend on you, right? For example, and you 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 become forced to adapt to that reality, right? And some things that become possible, you might ignore them, and so on and so forth. And that's just family circumstances. Again, it could be the economy, like in your case, like you, you left Lebanon and moved to Salamanca. The and, economy, uh, the economy, the environment, right? You you adapt to it, right? And um, now, I think that's a that's a uh, that's part of it, right? The 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 more you do it, I think it's like a muscle, right? The muscle you stress it a little bit and it becomes stronger. Uh, the more um, uh, sort of the market changes into small ways, uh, the the better you become at fending for yourself. And this is the t this is the thing that I uh, I still can't articulate it well, and I'm looking for the right way to explain it, but I'm going to try anyway, <laughs> like. I feel over the last four years or so, I've become very good at fending for myself. Like I've built enough confidence that I feel like almost no matter what happens, economic changes, hyperinflation, AI taking over the world, zombie apocalypse, world wars, <laughs> whatever happens, I feel like I will figure out a way to make ends meet. Like I'll adapt, <laughs> right? And I sort of... Uh, built a good sense of finding opportunities and inserting myself into them and again not wedding myself to job titles or skills or whatever and I, like this is something that I think uh, the only way to go become good at it is to start taking some risks you need to start building that risk taking muscle dealing with uncertainty doing things where the payoff is is uncertain right and then uh, you observe the results and sort of you start to build that part of your brain that's good with fuzzy logic. This is the problem I think I lost when I was an employee. And I think many people who are in the corporate world lose is the inability to think outside of a spreadsheet. <laughs> like when I was working at Amazon, almost every decision we've made needed to be pros and cons weighted with numbers. Like even choosing a name for a product, nobody says, Let's go with this product. I like it. It gives me a good feeling, whatever. No, you had to go do customer surveys, tally up all the numbers, and then we choose the one that got the most points. Like nothing was driven by gut, by the subconscious, right? Which is, I believe the subconscious is the smarter part of our brain when it comes to dealing with uncertainty, what we call our gut feel or whatever, right? And uh, I think the only way to strengthen that muscle again, right, that mental muscle, is to start taking some risks to making decisions that you can't do on a spreadsheet because you can't do it, right? You can't quantify, you can't measure things, you can't even observe everything, right? And uh, you get better at it. Like, you know, like you when you started the classes for philosophy, right? I mean, how do you define, the, like, how do you determine what good enough content? How do you determine how many sessions to make? How do you determine how, what price to set? There's infinite possibilities there. You could have created classes that could have lasted six months. You had done one class. You, they could have been 30 minutes each, two hours each, three hours. You could have charged $1,000, $50, $500. Like, 
you, in the beginning, you, you're clueless, right? You start, you know, trying or maybe mimicking some other successful product, like as a starting point. And then over time, you start becoming better. You probably already have a feeling of, you know, this price point is probably too high. I probably be hard to fill a class if I charge so much, right? And probably if, you know, you start getting this, I like to call it probabilistic knowledge. Right? It is not knowledge, that is concrete knowledge, the type of knowledge that we learn you know, in, in books or one plus one equals two, that's like concrete knowledge, it's a fact. This is probabilistic knowledge, right? It's likelihoods, unlikelihoods, patterns, and whatever. And I think the only way to build this is just to put yourself out there, take some risks, not necessarily risking something consequential, but just doing something with an uncertain payoff, right? And doing it over and over. Uh, yeah, in my case, like, for example, this uh, is, yeah, tell me. No, no, sorry. Uh, I was thinking a good example, and that's something I use in my course. Like, imagine our ancestors 10,000 years ago, hunter gatherers living off the land. Imagine how different the world was. Like, you, you wake up in the morning, there's no food, you have kids, they're hungry, and you have to go out in the forest to find food. Like, you have no idea where the forest is, like where the food is. Every step like, that our ancestors made was a decision under uncertainty, right? It's completely different than the world of today when you receive a steady paycheck loaned to two decimal places every month and you know exactly what the price of butter and milk and bread is at the supermarket, right? Um, and I think this is a skill that we, that, that we lose just by living a very, very predictable life. Like, our ancestors managed to tame that uncertainty, that right? go in the forest every day and find something, always. Like, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Of course, some of them didn't make it, but many of them did, <laughs> right? And uh, we're here today, right? And um, I think that's something probably still in our DNA, right? I mean, we haven't changed that much in the last 300, 400 generations, right? I mean, we're probably still hunter-gatherers uh, at, a, at a DNA level. Uh, but I think again, like like a like a muscle that you don't use, it tats off each away. I think once you live a very steady lifestyle, that part of the brain you almost lose it. Yeah, and uh, these are uh, this is this is very interesting because uh, you're right. It's we we kind of uh, became too comfortable in a way. That's on the one hand when it comes to handling and adapting to uncertainty and on the other hand when it comes to things like amazon and big companies and using spreadsheets uh, instead of relying on gut feeling i also understand that and i think this is this is the problem uh when it comes to extremes right because we we did discuss this before uh scale plays an important role like when you're mm -hmm. in a place uh, like amazon and you have many managers and directors and many departments and so many uh, things at stake, right? You have to, yeah. like, this is the most kind of objective way to decide mm -hmm. what yeah. uh, what to call a product and how to evaluate and get feedback, etc. I feel like this is this is the on, only, maybe not only, but one of the main reasons why we do these things. Uh, mm -hmm. And I experienced that firsthand in a startup at university archives like it and doing my own thing because you mentioned my my classes when when you're alone the scale is kind of too small so you can go with gut feeling because you can change things at a whim doesn't work this month you do that uh you you change the next month within six months i've rebranded like 500 times already over mm -hmm. the past three years right and I'm I'm almost sure you you did too uh, with mm -hmm. Twitter yeah. uh, core uh, the the AWS book Twitter and then mm -hmm. you even dabbled in uh, woodworking and you know and now the small bats community so mm -hmm. so I think it's for those who might be listening to us and who follow you on Twitter and who also uh, maybe sign up for for the uh, for your course community etc. I don't. Th so you're you're right in 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 using the the meta the the example of of hunter gatherers etc. But it's not so. I don't think the answer therefore is to just take the plunge, right? As such, it's just the awareness that we are too comfortable, and this is where maybe Hassan comes in as mm -hmm. a middle ground of some sort. Mm -hmm. Hassan Osman, author on the side, because Hassan is the example of someone who. 
and I want to know what you think about this, right? As mm-hmm. as someone who's who 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 is fit for the structured nine to five job, right? But mm-hmm. then he's aware about the uncertainty, and he doesn't want to just be complacent, kind of, and be too comfortable with his steady paycheck. And that's why he mm-hmm. goes out every day after his job to mm-hmm. kind of look for a possible yeah. for extra food to keep on the side. And that's why mm-hmm. he develops courses, and that's why he develops etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now. What what do you think about that? Because uh, so would would you say no? I need to go to the extreme and be constantly alert, uh, to be able to fend for myself and adapt, or yeah. would you say whatever works for anyone? And so far as they're aware that it's like you can lose your job at any point in time, and then how would you prepare for such uncertainties and uh, events which will happen sooner or later? Or what would you? Uh, I th- I think uh, um, uh, I'm certainly not against taking an incremental approach to to uh, changing your work arrangements, like uh, having side projects or you know minor tweaks, right, to to make things better. But I think it needs to be balanced with the fact that it's very easy to be trapped into something that. Uh, and this this is again like from my experience, my own personal experience, and from people who I know closely who work in tech. That they I know, and this happened to me as well for a few years. Right, you know you dislike this. Right, you know you wake up in the morning and you don't really want to go, and like it's, it's Sunday, and you know it's mon- mo- tomorrow is Monday, and you really don't feel like doing going, and there's all this negative feeling. Um, but then you keep saying, "Oh, but I, you know, I, I just going to wait until until I get my next promotion, so that I have a stronger resume, or I'm going to wait. I'm so close to getting a pay raise or a bonus, I should wait for it. Or now my kids are almost grown up, uh, so I'll wait until they go to college and then I'll take the plunge. Or I'm about to have a kid, so I'll wait until." Um, you know, the kid is born, so I'll have ha- good health insurance. There's always some excuse, and it's so easy to fall into this. And you know, one of the one of the biggest traps, pe- you know, big companies do, at least in the United States, is they tend to give you, um, especially the public companies, big companies, part of your compensation that vests in the future, right? So there's also these psychological traps of if you leave now, you're going to lose all that money that otherwise you're going to be getting. Right, if you just show up for another year or so, right? So there's all these intentional and unintentional traps. I really believe that again, like if you if you're convinced that you discovered that that your true preference true preference of how you work is incompatible with your uh, with your arrangement, probably the best strategy. I'm not going to generalize that in every circumstances, but probably in most situations, the best strategy is to take the plunge and make that work right use the motivation that you have to make it work to make it work right um i'm like i don't know hassan and i like i know him but i don't know him enough to speak on his behalf or what he's through the thinking but i'm almost certain that if he were to take the plunge uh he'll figure out a way right um, because he's capable uh he's uh, he figured out he's been doing side projects for more than me right, for over 10 years um, um uh, you know he'll probably be making less money than he is almost certainly for a long time right i'm not so sure but, now uh, after 10 yeah, years, I, 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 I think he he's capable of making yeah, yeah. It, um, just by giving Maybe, talks yeah. i think and workshops talks yeah. consulting <laughs> workshops yeah like he's connected he's skilled he has the like he he, he built he built his risk taking muscle right so he knows i think he has a good sense of this is unlikely to work this is more likely to work and sort of improve his odds of success like he's not just throwing random things at the wall he's in excellent shape but but again like maybe maybe it's the type of personality that he enjoys going in the morning and there's a to-do list and you need to get to this to-do list right and it gets done and that's it right to me it's the opposite like it's just you know, one of the one of the one of the rituals in software development that I really hated. It, it used, it's called the daily stand up, right? And software development teams do this, where like at 10 a.m. in the morning, everyone huddles up in a circle and they say, 
you know, you're, you're supposed to have like five minutes to say what you did yesterday, what you're planning to do today, and if there's any blockers. And you go in circles, and that used to kill me <laughs> because I don't work like that. I don't work in a continuous, monotonous uh, slog. Sometimes I produce 100 times more than my average, and most of the times I'm just thinking, wondering about, don't, going nowhere that ends. So I always felt like I had to force myself to come up with some, some something that seems, even though technically it's okay to say I didn't make any progress, whatever, but again, the expectation is that you're making a continuous progress that you're making that in in a five week work five day work week you're making one fifth progress per day right of the of the target of the week right yeah, it's like machines yeah, so yeah. on the assembly line right i mean uh, and i think creative work knowledge work rarely works that way i'm not going to say never right but it's very hard to do but certainly not with my personality, right? I just never work like that, right? It's, I, I always work when I'm inspiration-driven, opportunity-driven, right? And uh, I just can't make myself work just because it's 10 a.m. <laughs> and I have to work, right? Yeah, and uh, see, this is this is a thing, and I, I completely agree with you when it comes to, like, on, on this aspect, because at one point in time, I would... This is just a mindset kind of, and I know this might be a naive uh, attitude or uh, view of approaching things as well. So I got to a point, maybe this is also the muscle I'm exercising for the past mm -hmm. three, four years now, but uh, I, I think to myself, um, there's an opportunity there. Uh, any opportunity freelance or anything right uh, the, it could be like writing articles mm -hmm. and i think to myself why like would i be motivated if i'm writing about mm -hmm. these topics for someone else mm -hmm. as a as a not as a freelancing kind of project but as a full-time or even part-time kind of thing continue on a continuous basis and then i think to myself but i if i can do that and i mm -hmm. would be much more motivated if i'm writing it on my own generating my own content kind of then why wouldn't mm -hmm. i do it all by myself right why do i have to wait for someone to give me the opportunity just for mm -hmm. them to give me like a paycheck eventually and that's it on a and i'm not talking about you know freelancing projects uh you you do that like you know the, the design or whatever you do it and and you're done no i'm talking about this steady kind of paycheck one thousand mm -hmm. dollars a month whereby you do this and that's it like if if you can do that for other people why wouldn't you do it for yourself because you're going to be more motivated you're going to be you understand how you work uh mm -hmm. you you might leave things to the last minute no one is going to be bothering you about it you're gonna write the article because this is what i'm doing now right when it uh, when yeah. it comes to my mm -hmm. newsletter and now with the podcast mm -hmm. and and all these things will they generate money i don't care <laughs> They might create opportunity. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Am I enjoying my time? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is this is kind of like I understand where you're coming from because I think even if you were doing the same, like if you want to do the same things you were doing at Amazon now, you would be much more motivated doing them on your own. Yeah, and I would eliminate, you know, all the purposeless stuff, right? That at least yeah. purposeless to me. I mean, I'm certain, certainly to somebody there, it wasn't purposeless, but uh, again, it's another thing that used to wear me out. Nobody likes, I mean, no matter, almost no matter how much you're getting paid, working on something you feel it's useless, just, again, just, just, and I, I think there's different tolerances for this as well. It used to kill me, I'm sure, uh, there's others who tolerate it more and probably others who tolerate even less than I do, right? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I I, I, I agree. Uh, have you done a PhD, by the way? No, no, I stopped after my bachelor's, so... Oh, oh okay. I wasn't I wasn't fit for uh, structured education. Either. But that, that's that's why I'm that's why I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm asking. So because actually, actually just even finishing my four year degree was uh, I stretched it actually to six years because I I failed one year and I missed <laughs> an exam the last year. <laughs> um, so um, 
uh, yeah, like, and this is this to be. It's interesting, right? Because this is something uh, I uh, I always thought I'm a self directed learner. I dislike structure completely. Right? Uh, I I mostly learned even programming from books on my own, tinkering uh, at my own pace. Um, and what's funny is that when I heard about the idea of cohort courses, classes like this, initially. I dislike them, dislike the idea. Like, why would I attend a live session with somebody and I have to be there at a particular date and whatever? Again, the structure, like, uh, it's insane. <laughs> and then uh, and then I attended one almost on a whim, not saying by accident, but, uh, but, but uh, of Joe Norman. You know Joe Norman, the complexity guy? Um, and I really enjoyed it, right, actually. Right? I enjoyed the... I was looking forward to having a class every Tuesday and Thursday. I was taking my kids to school, coming back at 10 a.m. my time. There was a class a couple of times a week and it lasted 14 months. And I missed it actually when it finished right? because there was something intangible. And this goes, this goes to show how complex we are as humans. Right? I mean, I lived, I'm almost 40 years old. I lived all my life believing that I avoid all structure as much as possible, especially with learning, education, Again, like even with working, right? I mean, I learned I wouldn't, I don't think I'm the kind of person who would enjoy going to a workshop with an actual person live. I learned from YouTube, trying things, right? Courses and things like that, self-directed. But in this case, I enjoyed it, right? So, and that made me think, then I joined a few others and then I joined yours as well. And so that literally came for the inspiration for me to do my own and host my own. And even that I was liking, right? Um, even though I'm repeating the same thing a lot of times, I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's funny, right? I'm I honestly enjoying it. Like you get a sense of uh, like exhilaration almost every time I finish a class, right? It's, 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 um, uh, it's, it's crazy. Like, so where do I sit on that? So, so maybe I was wrong that I completely dislike structure everywhere. There are some context, some situation, where it's actually some structure is enjoyable. Like, this is why I'm, I'm a big fan now. I've become a big fan of life classes versus the core. Like, for example, your class about philosophy in the small best community. Why don't we just record it and we just give it to everyone? Because it's not the same thing. Like, for some reason, people enjoy it more if they come and there's like 20 other people there and they ask questions and they see a few faces. Again, it's just human nature, right? This is just something that we can't really change. Like uh, self-directed is a bit forced, right? It's it's not forced. Like it's a bit against nature, right? You ha you need to be super motivated to do to go through it. Right? It needs to be something that's so intrinsic. But if it's just a philosophy class, <laughs> it's very hard to be intrinsic and motivated about it. <laughs> we need to get people together, right? To um, to to have that. And same thing with Joe Norman's complexity thing, right? I mean, if Joe Norman told me go read these four books and you'll learn everything you need to know, I wouldn't have done it. I might have you bought wouldn't. them, and they would have sat on my bookshelf forever. But the fact that I showed up, I made a cup of coffee, uh, it's a big Zoom meeting, right? And there was Joe speaking and giving examples. It was fun, right? I learned there was a few aha moments. Oh, that's great. Like the, these topics about scale and whatever, they're very interesting from a more technical level. Um, um, and it, 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 was, it was an interesting experience, like reflecting myself, my own emotions on how I reacted to that made me realize, you know, this is a very fascinating medium, right? And, um, um, uh, and it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, because so this is a thing. Something similar happens uh, with me as well because I do dislike structure, but then, and maybe because I do dislike structure, I understand, uh, and I always understood that students might not be intrinsically motivated to take philosophy. I mean, who the hell cares about mm -hmm. philosophy, right? Especially at university when I was mm -hmm. uh, still teaching undergrads. And that's why I, I, I always kind of tried to get them to forget about the grade, to forget about the exams, because maybe what, what you disliked about structure is, in addition to the fact that you had to be present face to face, but it's, it's like, you know, you have to sit for an exam, you yeah, have the exam uh, the test material obsession. that you need yeah. to read and, and then they'll test you for it. And you know, it's all pointless because ultimately 
it, whatever you learn and your knowledge is cannot be tested this way. Maybe it can mm -hmm. for like medicine and other stuff. But when you're talking, uh, I'm, I mean, computer science, it, it's pretty obvious, but then you can know things theoretically and you might graduate. And I know for a fact from like a, a, anecdotally, but fr friends of mine who graduated fr in computer science and then you, they couldn't develop uh, mm -hmm. anything because they yeah. it was all it too happens. theoretical right and so unless you're motivated and you want to do that it's uh yeah you would uh, like so i understand that but maybe in in your case and in, and also in my case and in joe's case in so far as there is no um there's no kind of uh the need to sit for exams and grading and readings maybe you can just show up enjoy your time socialize with others learn one thing or two that's it this is what human nature is about it's yeah. not uh, about being tested and testing your mm -hmm. not unless again it's something okay. very important but yeah mm -hmm. it's uh, it's quite interesting because you you did change your opinion on that and you also recorded a, a, a twitter course and it was pre-recorded yeah yeah How, it's, and that's, uh, it's, that's, that taught me something like i mean the the it was exhausting, even just doing that one hour take of the Twitter course. Um, look, like me speaking with you here, this feels completely natural. Like it's like you're here, it's like feels uh, like a normal human interaction. Me recording myself in front of a camera is completely the opposite for me. Again, this personality, I'm, I know people like all the TikTokers or whatever, they feel differently. But for me, it just feels... Totally bizarre. Like I remember recording that Twitter course one hour. Like I was so tired. I think I slept for like ten hours straight immediately afterwards. It was just took all my energy out. And the fact for the small bets course, I was originally thinking of doing something similar. But then I realized, look, I, here I have like ten hours of content. Probably this, uh, like, and actually I thought uh, at some point I thought I'm going to carve out two weeks and do it slowly. But I kept putting it off, procrastinating, never wanting to do it because it just felt very strange. And uh, again, like, and I'm sure like the quality of of the content wouldn't have been the same as well. Whereas just me starting up a Zoom meeting, a few people show up and I just talk about it, completely different experience. And that's why why I'm repeating it. Like in a couple of weeks, I'm going to start the 26th course uh, version, right? So people sometimes think like, it doesn't. Why are you doing this? Why are you sh repeating it? Why don't you just record it or, or whatever? But again, it's just, first of all, for me, it feels uh, easy. Uh, honestly, it's easier. I mean, it, it, now I've done it so much that I literally just, you know, show up and I can sort of uh, give my presentation with very little effort. And uh, there's the other benefits as well, I think, for it, for the members being there, right? It's I'm almost certain right, that like only a small tiny fraction would even go to the entire 10 hours of content if it wasn't live. And you could try to resist this again. Resisting this, it's again like using the metaphor of the palm tree in Alaska. Yes, you know, you could force yourself or try to um, uh, force your students to join by giving them points or some gamification system or something that they create certificate yeah or you can't they they won't be able to to fast forward or or, or, or sending them an email of the week like uh, something fascinating actually I, i'm going to jump to attention because again it's a bit of an inconsistency here but i took a woodworking course online online woodworking course one of the first one actually and one of the best ones for beginners and i signed up and i thought i was going to receive all the content immediately i paid 70 bucks and this guy had like seven projects on the landing page. This is what you'll learn after you take my woodworking course. Like a dining table, like, um, you know, a box, uh, a few, like a, uh, a few other things. I don't even remember. But there were seven projects. And then when I signed up, the guy didn't send me anything. I, actually, he said, next Saturday, I'm going to send you the plans and the video to do the first project. <laughs> and then every weekend, I will send you a new one. It was all automated. Right to uh, sort of to software, and at first I thought, wow, what a, what a, I feel ripped off. Like I, I wanted to just start working on this thing immediately, but then again, to be honest with you, like if I actually to, I was honest with myself, I actually started to enjoy the. I was looking forward to next Saturday receiving a new piece of content, right? Because I actually I was following 
I did the the bench. I, that was the first. Uh, the, uh, the first project was actually a workbench for the workshop. Then the next was like a small outdoor bench, and the third was like a picture frame, and the fourth was a coffee table or whatever. And he told you like next week is going to be this, and you're going to receive the plans. And he structured it in a way that like on a Friday he gives you the material list to go to your to to the to the lumber yard and buy the tools and the, the material you need, and then on the on the weekend you you work on it. And this made me think, like, I mean, this is interesting. This is very structured, artificially structured, actually, because this is not the guy say it's not like it's a, it's an in-person workshop and the guy is only there on weekends. This is to software. He has a, a condition saying if today is Saturday, send out the next <laughs> release. But I have to admit with myself that this is what actually was beneficial to me. You know, I think probably I would have been overwhelmed if I received them all at one go. It was enjoyable to receive this. These again, I missed. Once they finished, I missed them. I said, in fact, I bought his second course <laughs> uh, because I wanted another drip of these things. Right. So it's funny. Like it's all human psychology again. Like it's trying to. I think trying to study our own behavior sometimes probably is the best way to not get fooled by our rational way of thinking things and being reductionist with human nature. We're super complex. So. This and I think this is my point. Despite me disliking in general highly structured things and living all my life where I've been very self-directed learner and uh, you know traditional education mostly failed me because it was very structured work arrangements. The forty-hour work week I tolerated for a bit, but it was almost on the brink of a nervous breakdown. I dislike structure. Like there's a lot of evidence. Nevertheless, I have to recognize that in some instances it works. And I, I I find it enjoyable and it's sort of more effective. Right? So it's even probably the label of structured disliker is probably inadequate. So right? it's a bit more complicated than than that. And this is interesting because I'm now see one of one of the things I'm I'm trying to develop now is some sort of after these three years of tinkering around. And thanks to opportunities like the small bets uh, talk on stoicism and uncertainty, I'm trying to develop this course for uh, on philosophy for professionals. But after all mm-hmm. these years now, I feel like I'm I'm ready to do this, divide it into three parts, asking meaningful questions, navigating uncertainty, and then an intro to moral reasoning. So what would be a course uh, divided over three uh three weeks or four weeks where we discuss moral reasoning and debate and stuff like that now i i feel like i'm ready to just you know cut the fluff and present it in one mm-hmm. session because i was i was thinking should i should i do this as a pre-recorded course or should i continue doing this as a workshop if if this is uh what i wanna uh if, mm-hmm. if this is much better like as a workshop and i think based on what we're talking now it's you're right like unless it's less than two hours it would be pointless Mm -hmm. to create a pre-recorded course because otherwise no one would finish it it's it's too long and then uh so so yeah let's uh let's see how that goes and also thanks to to, to the this is going june 27 i think would be the fifth or sixth iteration Mm -hmm. and this is part of what you are talking about right doing this live even if it's stoicism yeah. the sixth time everyone you see how people react the kind of mm-hmm. examples they bring up so you also adapt and you improve the content based on what sticks what doesn't yeah. and you keep improving and refining and then it makes it even more engaging and more helpful exactly. to people etc and you can read the room in real time again based on the reactions comments questions you you you, you start sensing whether people are getting the message it's 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 different right i i I agree because when you're when you're pre-recording a course it's uh, you assume that this is the the material that's going to stick but then it yeah it need like uh it works for things like twitter because you're like okay i Mm -hmm. did this and this is how you can maybe grow your audience but then when you're dealing with things like complexity and philosophy and even now small bets it's like how do you (laughs) how do you pre-record that you're it's it's already you're not telling them you should do this or do that it's it's just a a a journey whereby you're just trying to Mm -hmm. 
explain and uh, interact and create this atmosphere between people to see how how they can relate to this and whether or not it resonates with them. So mm-hmm. I think that yeah, this is this is a good approach when it comes to synchronous courses. But do you think this might not be mm-hmm. kind of something you you thought about? But uh, do you feel like there's Zoom? virtual kind of async uh, synchronous virtual meetups fatigue I, look i i maybe but again this is something i think that if you're in this game you will adapt to it right i mean right now people are still signing up right um uh like in, in our community uh, monday like, like earlier this week we started this newsletter course with louis and chris and we had like record turnout, record registration. So my information right now, my signals are that, yeah, maybe there is fatigue, but it's not showing up yet. At some point, if people stop showing up or start seeing the numbers going down, then you adapt. Then maybe we do local meetups physically, right? I mean, we'll just split up based on locations and once every six months we meet up in person or maybe it will be over over email even more virtual who knows or maybe something right uh, this this i think this is the this goes back to defending for yourself skill building the muscle type of thing i don't know what the future is going to look like and that's again like this is something that i also dislike about all the you know, especially in tech, but on Twitter in general, like people trying to predict what's going to happen, the trends and all that nonsense. Uh, like it's futile, right? And potentially harmful, I think, to try to rely on being good at predicting what's going to happen uh, or even what is happening. Right? Because like actually last to, yesterday, I think, somebody was semi-viral tweet saying, uh, communities are dead. Like no, uh, they they blew up in 2020, and now nobody wants to join any more communities. My community is growing; had a record month, uh, year year and year. It's sort of growing every time. Is it? I mean, I don't think there. Maybe some of them failed too. Maybe uh, again, maybe at the collective level, the community economy is shrinking. I have no idea. Possible that like maybe there was a big spike after the pandemic whatever and now only a few remain but uh, that information is almost useless to me right or maybe i don't fit as a community label who who cares again all these boxing and coming up with jargon of trying to articulate and represent things you know it's uh, so yeah like zoom fatigue is a description of an emotion maybe it's happening at a collective level right but I put out a Zoom Luma invite, right? And people sign up and it makes it a sustainable business for now, right? I mean, every month the sales are more than the expenses <laughs> and I just keep doing it until at some point. And I am, again, I'm not saying this is going to continue forever. I'm certainly not. Uh, when's the, when it starts to go down below some threshold, you know, it's negative feedback that right? you're forced to react like a thermostat, right? The temperature is out below 20 degrees. Now <laughs> you start- Do you have that. some sort of uh, goal uh, when it comes to the community, maybe like hit the 1 million revenue or something? Uh, After not which really. you would pull the uh, plug? Uh, like what? Like because it's like, too for successful? Example, or to, to, uh, no, no, <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, but maybe you would think to yourself, like if, if I hit that threshold, that's it. That's I, really, no. I'm, I'm, I'm again, it's, it's, it's another thing I, I try to not think much about because again, like it depends so much on what's happening in the present and that point. Right? I mean, uh, honestly, again, like to me, like the, the, the month, like again, today is the first of the month. It's it's an interesting time frame because I like to think on a month month by month basis, right? It's like, okay, this month now it starts from everything starts from zero, and um, what what should my priority be this month? And you know, try to <laughs> try to make the best out of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, no goals so it's again. No, mostly yeah, I yeah. mostly driven by the down, by the downside. That I mean, mostly driven by, um, um, uh, you know, of course I wanted, uh, uh, you know, I. I want to try to not make it fail, right? So that's what I focus on. Like, how can I make sure that people are still enjoying being there and tell their friends about it? 
right? And uh, people, new people know about the community and they focus on that and uh, sort of let the upside take care of itself, right? Sort of more trying to get uh, to get enough attention to just keep it keep it surviving. Again, like this is another thing, maybe uh, um, another, there's probably an hour, another hour worth of discussion. <laughs> it's like the focus on survival, I think it's so important and so underrated, right? And this is, I think, another attitude that many people miss. Um, and I think it helps me a lot. It's literally almost all my decisions are about what can I do today to extend my survival a little bit <laughs> more, right? And even though it might seem like another way of looking at things, I think it actually makes you do things differently. Right. This is this is very interesting because my I've I've been thinking about this in relation to to my situation as well, which is mm -hmm. even a bit trickier maybe than your situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I sometimes feel that when it comes to survival. And uh, you might not even have an answer for that, right? It's just I'm, I'm trying to. Ref I was trying to reflect on this. There are two ways of handling uh, this uh, precarious situation of adopting this cockroach mindset that uh, that you talk mm -hmm. about. I feel that sometimes you might enter into a frenzy, kind of trying to survive at all cost, and then you will be blinded by the opportunities that might be uh, presenting themselves to you, you would uh, not be able to distinguish signal uh, from noise. And mm -hmm. versus the other kind of whatever it is, uh, the mindset whereby you're reacting to this precarious situation in a way so as you don't end up having a nervous breakdown, right? Because I was in both situations. Like at mm -hmm. one point when you don't know where you're heading and you're struggling to survive so as, as though you're, you know... Um, um what would the uh it's it's like you're just struggling for uh, trying to find some sort of uh harbor to not drown mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that's a, a some sort of uh stick to hang to but or versus uh yeah. doing it more in a in a more calm serene way structured mm -hmm. kind of somewhat knowing where to uh, look for other opportunities have you ever been in that situation it's like um, st no, struggling no, for your like, life and yeah. then you're drowning right well, so so i think again this it's probably a case of the dose makes the poison right i mean i'm i think and similar maybe to our discussion about scale changing things um like extreme stress is probably not that useful, right? So uh, in terms of being able to recover out of it, it can become its own cycle of like probably what you're implying, right? Of desperation. So um, I think if, you, if you're in an extreme hardship situation, the only priority is to get out of that extreme hardship situation, right? It's just, uh, you know, you, you, it can't be, like, uh, of course, you know, uh, surviving here, is that, uh, it's a relative term, of course. Right? I mean, there's a big difference between literally surviving, like you're in a war-torn country and you're, like, you're, you're, you're getting bombed and you're trying to survive versus how we're using it ourselves as trying to be, remain self-employed, for example, right? Um, um, uh, I think, and again, maybe, maybe I'm not getting the question completely, right? But uh, I feel that if the situation is extremely dire and extremely harsh, you know, it's the, the, the only, probably the only problem you have there is like getting out of it, right? As quickly as possible to get to a place where, uh, you know, but it's, you can it's have also some even, even, even if it's harsh, this is the thing. It's like, I, even if it's harsh, the way, like, do you have, have you, uh, sometimes it, it happens to me, right? Like you feel mm -hmm. you want to survive, but then mm -hmm. you're just, uh, you you spiral down in a way such that ever you you don't know what you're doing, kind of, right? So for example, uh, someone who's, yeah. who's not happy in their job, they would start sending mm -hmm. like 100 CVs daily, mm -hmm. uh, just to get out of it. But then they're not really yeah. thinking, so it's, they're not thinking straight, they they don't take a step back and try to mm -hmm. approach the situation maybe from a different perspective where they would 
uh, think more maybe strategically about how they're going to survive. So I, I feel like there are two kinds of ways of handling uh, these situations mm -hmm. and trying to survive. One where you're just uh like you you launch a product that doesn't work and then you're you, you think of another product and as this product is not working you're you're already thinking about the third thing and then you're you're just mm -hmm. uh, spending yeah. more money and and uh struggling to find the branch to, to, mm -hmm. to kind of not drown etc versus a more laid it, uh, laid back yeah. informed approach in order to survive but not to be blindsided by everything around you kind of i i, I suspect it is a problem of um people not uh, uh not working backwards from what they truly want and i think it all boils down again to 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 this, to preferences question it's like you know the example of launching products randomly trying to to, to throw things at the wall seeing what sticks and nothing is working whatever i think it's usually a problem of you think you want to have a successful product, right? But maybe what you truly want is to not have a boss and work for yourself and not having to be nine to five and commute to the office or whatever. <clears throat> so the question you should be asking yourself is like, what's the easiest way for me to fulfill that uh, situation? It might not be launching a product. It might be doing freelancing or uh, you know taking a part-time job or some or maybe working to, if, if what you really hate is the commute right or whatever it's maybe you, you take a remote job and still work for t full time and um i think once you once you truly understand what you're really doing things tend to become easier and more clear right it's just because and I, again like this is something i experienced myself and this is what the excessive runway harmed me in. In the beginning, I thought I want to build an ideal business or with, an, with my ideal product. I had all these visions that I wanted to fulfill. Then I had a bit of a crisis of anxiety about six months in, where I had already you know, wasted a good part of my savings. I still hadn't had anything that was making me money. And I said, to the, like, again, my subconscious was telling me, look, if you keep on this path, there's a good chance that you're going to waste all your savings, you know, months and years pass quickly, and you'll have nothing to show for, and you'll end up having to go back to a full-time job. And then I realized the only the, the thing I really don't want is to go back where, where I left. Like, I don't care about the project I was working on. I don't care about the business or creating this or that. I just want to maintain this kind of lifestyle right, of working for myself, not being accountable to a boss or going on somebody else's terms and all that stuff and that made immediately made everything more clear because then i how started, did you snap out of it yeah it's, it's i think the only thing i would give myself credit to is that when i had the sense of anxiety i didn't just try to hide it or fight it i yeah. gave it the benefit of the doubt like i i i i treated it with respect <laughs> that it's probably there for a reason and I think this is a modern world problem of trying to fight all our subconscious negative emotions, procrastination, anxiety, lack of attention, boredom, almost all productivity books and all advice that you see is how to fight these things. We like to believe that our subconscious is like a vestigial organ that we can probably just surgically remove, like the appendix, <laughs> and we'll probably be better off. But uh, that's so, I think that's so naive and foolish, right? And, um, you know, uh, there's, there's this like computer inside of our brain that unfortunately speaks to us in very primitive ways, you know, just keeps you up at night or makes you demotivated, but it's usually there telling you something important. And basically, I think what I snapped out of it because I kept thinking, what would make me not anxious? And... I thought, probably if I make some money this month, I remember it was September of 2019, and I thought, if I make some money this month, probably that would improve my anxiety levels. So far, it was almost seven months or eight months I had made no money at all. And then I quickly asked myself, what's the easiest way for me to make some money? I signed up to some freelancing sites. Then I went to my phone contact list and I found somebody who might want to hire me for some freelancing work. And eventually the second one worked and I got a small gig, like it was 10 hours a month, nothing crazy. Um, 
but it made a huge, huge difference in my peace of mind, getting a check and sort of depositing it. And then I knew I could take more hours. I could find another client. I could continue scrolling to my phone list and maybe find somebody else and uh, made a big difference. Right? And suddenly then I started to realize, okay, now I survived September. I actually managed to almost make as much money. Now I'm going to focus on October. And October, then I worked in my advice, right? And then okay, I had a project now. I, I, sa I said, I want to finish it in a month. And so then I started doing all these things again, just focusing on survival. And it, over time, things started, again, I, I kept exercising, exercising my risk-taking muscle. I became better at not doing things that are unlikely to work. I got, again, uh, without fooling myself that, I know for certain what's going to work or not. Right? So there's still uncertainty, it's still a game of uncertainty, a game of poker. But you start building this probabilistic knowledge. Probably just like the hunter-gatherer would have, they, the hunter-gatherer probably wouldn't just start walking randomly. Exactly. The they say, uh, yeah, uh, precisely. Slightly there's going to be food close to the liver. Or now it's winter, there's probably going to be more over there. Or yesterday I saw something there, maybe it's more likely that there's going to find something else there. Sickness like that, that you're not, you don't know for certain, but you keep moving towards them. Yeah. And uh, the, the start wrapping it up, I know this question might not make sense, uh, but how does someone who dislikes structure ends up working at Amazon for so many years so, and gets promoted? <laughs> <laughs> so at first I thought it was going to be temporary. Right? I remember telling my wife, because actually we moved from Malta to Ireland. Both me and we weren't married yet, but we took the plunge again. We thought we wanted to try going abroad. And uh, I certainly, for me, it was a temporary thing. Right? I, I grew up in Malta, small country, like limited professional opportunities. I was interested in tech. I always felt like I'm missing out on big tech, right? I mean, I used to work with these tools and databases, but I had no idea how these tools and big things are made. So it was more sort of curiosity to see a bit how the sausage is made in a big place. So I went with the attitude, this temporary for me. Eventually, soon, I will maybe spend a couple of years, absorb as much as I can. I wasn't thinking financially back then. You know, my offer back in Ireland wasn't that... Uh, extraordinary that I, I thought it was just a knowledge acquisition exercise but then I got trapped right this is this is the thing like then they promoted me immediately after the first year then like uh, a year and a half after they offered me to move to Seattle then they promoted me again then my salary like doubled and then tripled and then I got an offer to go work for another company and Amazon like matched the offer and beat it, and like suddenly overnight again, like my salary like almost almost doubled again, even though it was already very high. And they kept telling me, "Look, you're on the right track. If you keep going here, uh, if you keep growing here, you have a bright future. So much opportunities. Again, recruiters calling you all the time. Like you feel, you start feeling like uh, nothing is going to come close to this working for myself if you measure things from a financial perspective, right? So. Um, uh, I remember, I remember. So they used to assign us these mentors right, to sort of help us in our career path. And my mentor told me, I dislike, I highly dislike this mentorship structure, <laughs> but whatever, I had to do it. <laughs> um, but I remember my mentor told me, look, at some point, you're very likely going to have a Wikipedia page about you. You're going to invent something so novel that you're going. And <laughs> and I remember leaving the room thinking, it's you know that would be nice, right, to have a Wikipedia page. And my mentor basically told me, think about what you want your Wikipedia page to say about you. And sort of I, I went, I leaned onto it. I, I kept thinking about it a little bit. And but I remember then after like a week or so, at one point I realized, like who cares. <laughs> like why do I even want a Wikipedia page and um, um, like what if I don't have a Wikipedia page and sort of suddenly I said to hell with it like I don't care and I felt a, a sense of liberation of like I don't want to play this game like I don't care to have a Wikipedia page or whatever right I just want to be free do whatever I, whatever I want and because like you get stabbed into this idea that you're doing something so big so important you're getting paid well you see that there's even more opportunity in the future so you're not, you're not like you have reached the top there's even more 
and there's all these signals right, that you're, you're so important. You can have a Wikipedia page, right? you, all these badges and prestige, especially here in the Seattle area, right? I mean, uh, um, Amazon is so concentrated that you go anywhere. Like if you show your Amazon badge, you get discounts and you're trusted and all this sort of stuff. It's hard to defeat psychologically. This this gets you. Now, this is the golden handcuffs. Like this is part of it. This is what they call them metaphorically. You're handcuffed. You're not really handcuffed, right? but you're handcuffed psychologically with all this stuff. And it took me a while, right? Again, like to to snap out of it again uh, to realize like this is not the path for me. And again, like uh, to 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 summarize it to a pity statement. I think what made me snap out of it. I looked around. I looked at all my colleagues, people higher up than me, my people in my same level, and I didn't envy anyone's lifestyle. Like I didn't want to be in anyone's situation. Right? Honestly, almost everyone was living a lifestyle that was much worse than I had. Right? And that sort of made me realize, uh, like these were people. Yes, they were well, well paid. Right? Driving again. Uh, they have two Teslas and a two million dollar home and whatever. So nothing. They, they, they. That was maybe something envious. But everything else, they woke up every day at six a.m. Left the house before the kids woke up. Came home at night tired. They barely see their family weak as they're always thinking about work. They're always on call, always something happening, always worried. Right? Occasionally they steal a week of vacation and they go to Hawaii, but it's so even the vacation is like stressful. Right? And they keep doing this over and over and over, right? Until they sort of get their nervous breakdown or, <laughs> or whatever. And that was the part I was moving towards. And I was already somewhat there already, right? And uh, I think that that was the thing that I realized. Like, if I don't quit, I'm going to end up like them, and the more they're becoming them. And that's what I think. In the situation, honestly, I think taking the plunge is the most rational thing, right? Because I think uh, you know, you just realize you're on the wrong path, and you just have to just hop off, right? You can't just keep tweaking it, right? So. But it took me a while. Right? So why did I spend a decade there? Initially, it was, I felt it was temporary. Right, first couple of years, I was enjoying it, taking it all as much as I could. Then there were like probably four years of thinking, of being trapped. And then I think another mistake that I did was again, thinking that I need to save more to build a better, better runway. So the last three years, I was already there on autopilot mode. Like if they fire me, I'm okay with it. <laughs> I want to leave, but I was thinking I want to milk this cow a bit more to b improve my bank account situation so that I have a bigger runway. And that also was a mistake. I think I should have left sooner because probably it was unnecessary, right? Beyond a certain point. I'm not saying like if you have nothing, right? Just quit immediately. If like you, you can't pay expenses like next month. But probably beyond like six months or whatever, probably would have all, all been, again, very likely, uh, not just unnecessary, but probably harmful. I think it's easier again to feel this like the guy in the way in the weightlifter, thinking all about the safety hinges. That's what I was doing, thinking all about. I have to do this runway. I'm saved so much time. I'm thinking there's always the fallback. I think you want to remember that you actually. You don't have to fall back. You don't not going there ever, <laughs> right? And that puts the fire under you, I think, to actually start seeing the real opportunities, right? And not be too idealistic, not be blinded by these sort of chi childhood dreams or other nonsense, and just go and make it work. You yeah, know, it forces that's... you to be to adapt and to be fit. This is this is interesting. It's like at first, yeah, you're learning, then you're trapped, and then. It's a yeah. vicious kind of cycle. It's a vicious uh, cycle, exactly. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, one last question, which uh, which might uh, seem cheeky as well. This is I don't know how you will, <laughs> but I don't even know how to articulate articulate this question. How do you feel about being called social media employee? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I. Uh... Look, if um, at all, right? But you, you get no, my, no, no. You, you, you get my point. It's interesting that I'm not. I think I would be lying if I say that. Um, 
So here's the thing. I'm very careful with the labels I assign to myself. That's why in my Twitter bio and how I introduce myself, I don't even use the terms entrepreneur or, or content creator or whatever, because these labels to me are meaningless. They mean different things to different people. And me, myself, I want to protect myself from feeling trapped with one label. Like people argue all the time, are you a true entrepreneur? Are you too blah, blah, blah? Like, I don't care. I, again, like my goal is just, I want to be self-employed. Maybe that's the only label because it's very factual what it means. Like I'm just, I uh, don't have an employer. Um, but you can't control how other people see you, right? So um, um, that's the reality, right? And uh, some people think uh, social media employee, thought leader, ex-Amazon, disgruntled employee, like they depending on what sliver of my story they've seen they come up with a description like who is this guy oh he's just uh he's just uh, a grifter on twitter <laughs> and that's the label they put in their head and then it's very hard to and then they see something they disagree with me and they go into twitter and say oh you're just a grifter you're saying this for the engagement blah 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 you're just a troll. it happens and i sort of started to realize that this is the human behavior they see something they don't understand they try to categorize it in their mental database with a label. Oh, this, he's just an online troll. And then they try to explain everything with that justification they did. Um, and I think this is just the cost of doing business online. Right? It's just part of the, part of the game. Um, uh, I think my lesson from that is to, for me to try to be careful not to do it on myself, because this is very easy to do uh again to stick a label to something to someone and then it's very hard to change your opinion after the fact right and this is what my critics do on me you know and i feel sorry for them just they have the wrong impression whatever um, um and uh you know i don't think you want to be uh, you know, you, 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 I don't want myself to fool myself again just because I jumped to a conclusion early and this is how I see things. Because this is how I think, again, this is how you lose. You, you create luck blindness, I like to call it. So I mean, once you start dismissing everything as, oh, that's just a, just, just a grifter or just, just a course creator, he's just a troll on the internet, whatever, then you see, everything is bad like for you like this is what i thought you, you know get a in their check get a v this is what he inspired me most of right is like he gets all these insults all the time because he's the kind of extroverted motivational speaker he attracts this kind of criticism right because that's the to some people that's the vibe he gets but uh he taught me to see that um that all of this just doesn't matter. Right? This is just what people are going to, some people are going to see you and the only thing you can control is how you behave. And uh, some people are going to see the full, all your full behavior and sort of understand you, but there's always going to be this part that, uh, you know, I just going to come up with labels and excuses and whatever. And um uh, it's what it is. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you're push pushing also the wrong buttons sometimes with uh, Paul responding to your memes yeah. and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and I, I'm planning to elaborate on more, even more on that because that's that goes all into like I have this post. It's almost done. I, I probably goes out in a in a week or two. Uh, it's all back to what we started with good for the collective, bad for the individuals. Why Combinator in particular, right? As a, as a startup incubator, venture capitalist type of thing. This is not the kind of, so I'm not against venture capitalist if you see it as a financial instrument, like getting a loan, you know, it's Elon Musk who wants to launch a, a spaceship company. He goes to venture capitalists that want to partner with him, right? To, in this sort of big journey. Great, that's, that's excellent. Y Combinator is different. It's like a school incubator type of program where it lures 20-year-olds, mostly boys, men, whatever. They're all full of ambitions of grandeur and whatever, right? Into this uh, sort of program, which makes it look like, like if you go to the Y Combinator website, our formula for success, our growth, our whatever. It's all pictures about what's good for the collective, what's good for the portfolio of Y Combinator. But the reality, 
Like they invested, they they enrolled four thousand, I think, people so far in their incubator. Like three thousand nine hundred and fifty out of those four hundred <laughs> ended up spending years of their prime of their life living in some damp basement in San Francisco with four roommates living on takeout food, um, learning things that are not going to be helpful to them if they were to work for themselves. So they will have to unlearn them, which sometimes it's harder to unlearn. And they were sold a false promise. They were duped into believing that's what's good for the economy, for the startup economy, for Silicon Valley is going to be good for them. And in fact, I think it's quite ridiculous that Paul Graham replied to me and say, oh, you're wrong because look at Stripe. Like he cherry picked one outlier success from 12 years ago. <laughs> it wasn't like he told me an example from yesterday. Like he had to go dig down to find that cherry picked example, like one out of 4,000. And I think it sort of proves my point. Like I, I don't know if Paul Graham, like he's certainly smart. And to be a venture capitalist, successful venture capitalist, I don't think you can be fooled by randomness too easily. You understand that things are more random than they seem and you need to diversify. And the things that paid off for him are the things that were likely the least one he expected. He talks about this, like Airbnb. He funded it on a whim, like it was just these two kids. He was probably focused on other things. Then this thing blew up, right? And became one of their biggest uh, successes. But then what he's recommending others is not to do like what he does like you should to go all in on ai keep pick a spot in the ground and keep digging for buried treasure in that spot don't diversify just keep digging to the center of the earth yeah you might end up digging for eternity if the treasure is not there who cares i have 10,000 others like you digging exactly. in different spots. Yeah. <laughs> like you're going to, you, this is wartime behavior. Like in wartime, we have to agree that we have to sacrifice the individual for the collective. That's the heroism of wartime. You know, the soldier on the battlefield, right? You're literally risking your life for the good of the country, the people back at home, whatever. This is wartime behavior. But in peacetime, this is ridiculous. In peacetime, we should be putting the individual as is the the, uh, the 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 goal of capitalism the individual as the center <laughs> and uh, and whatever happens to collective is, is is a positive side effect not flipping it the other way around like Paul Graham is telling this this story as if like he's the general in in battle rallying up the troops to go do on D Day and uh, and fight the Nazis uh, yeah most of you will die but it's you know it's to save the world and to save humanity. Is it really necessary, <laughs> right? Uh, right, yeah. right now, and especially, you know, you know, he's going after again, like twenty-two year olds, highly impressionable people that will likely waste a decade of their life doing things that they're not really going to help them. Again, that's something that they sell. Like, does you learn life-changing skills and whatever? I, actually, I think it's what they learn is probably more harmful than helpful because they learn how to play the Y Combinator game. Like this, they put them in this kindergarten-like structure, right, where they told you, just focus on building, we'll set you up with connections. Your goal is to get to the next fundraising round, blah, blah, blah. Real business is not, not like that. The business is understanding human human behavior, seeing what they want. Because it becomes about small bet. convincing others to give them money than exactly, actually... Exactly, to other investors, yeah. and that's, that's the whole Echo perverse chamber, structure, kind of. right? And, uh, and again, this uh, the... the Issue is that it's usually hard to unlearn things. Again, there's this human who we seem to suffer from this problem that once you form an opinion on something, it's very hard to change it. So once you think that the best way to start a business is by doing all these things, right? And like yesterday, like I tweeted about, like like people think like I need to start a, C a Delaware-based C corp because what if I sell my business and all this nonsense? No, like if you haven't made a single dollar yet, don't even think about creating shares and infrastructure and all that nonsense. But what Combinator tells you, before you do anything, before you even have any revenue, you need to set up a Delaware C Corp because for them to invest in you and for other investors, they need to have this structure. Right? So people, learn, this is just one example out of thousands, like people learn all these small things that then it becomes a habit and... Um, uh, it becomes easier, it becomes very hard to unlearn if they want to truly work for themselves right, and fend for, for, for uh, on their own.
Yeah. But so this is what Minya then, like I'm sort of. No, but then uh, this, is, this, is, <laughs> this is. This is. But it ties it all back to the beginning. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Exactly. It's like uh, this is this is where small bets come comes in. It's like don't uh, the individual versus the collective kind of idea. What works for the yeah. collective might not work for the individual, and vice versa. And context is also important. Like that's it's. Uh, in so far as people are aware that this is what they're doing, like putting all their eggs in one basket, f- at least for those who are participating in the Y Combinator thing. I mean, if they're aware that they need to have several uh, bets, etc., that's that's good. But then, as you said, many of them end up failing and then they, they're just spoiled yeah. uh, and they need to unlearn so many things because they think this is how business is done. Either way, I'm offended because, I mean, he replied to you, but then when I asked him if he uh, read <laughs> yeah. or reads philosophy, he doesn't respond to me. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, take that as a compliment <laughs> in your case. I mean, at least the guy is, is responding to you. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But this, is, this, this, was, uh, this was very... Uh, interesting. I I enjoyed uh, this discussion. I I am almost sure we can end up uh, having like the, discussing all this for another hour and a half. But uh, let's not extend that uh, beyond. I think an hour and a half. I think almost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, is is there anything else you'd probably add something you wanted to share but you haven't and afterwards where can people find you no i think we covered all the all the topics i took to talk about here yeah and people find me probably at twitter is the best place twitter dvasallo d-v-a-s-s-a-l-l-o i'm there almost daily you know um, <laughs> finding inspiration <laughs> finding inspiration too like that's that's my selfish uh use of twitter like looking at what other people are doing to 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 catalyze my my brain uh but i try to give back by replying to 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 people who have questions and i try to share a little bit of what i'm figuring out which i think can be inspiring to other people as well right so it's 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 uh definitely it's it was inspiring to, to me uh going all the way back so yeah and i was inspired yeah. by others right so that's that's one of the nice things of social media that i think it's rarely mentioned it's not all doom scrolling and <laughs> and, and and politics and whatever exactly knowing how to use twitter so yeah uh di vasallo on on twitter and uh thank you very much again for uh doing this and thank you everyone for listening Cheers. thanks mahmoud